So, back up in these deep woods, uh, there was a uh, one of the strange things that I would very often encounter was um, a whistle, and it was a it was a pretty specific whistle, and I knew that whistle when I heard it. Um, and, uh, you know, I imitated it. So, when I would hear it, I would often whistle back. The exact same whistle. And, uh, I didn't know if it was a bird or what. But, it had a... a you could imitate it with a human whistle, no problem. Um, but... It was significant to all the other sounds of the woods. It kind of st stood out. And, I mean, the first couple times I heard it, uh, years prior, um, uh, it actually, it, it spooked me, man, because, I mean, when you're out there singing, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to run into another person who's looking for saying. Um, it, it, they usually don't turn out to be positive encounters. So, you you generally would want to avoid another person in the woods. So when I first heard those uh, whistles, um, my instinct was to, you know, go away. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, after years of hearing them, uh, I figured it was a bird because, you know, it moved around with me. It, whether I was on the east side, the west side, the north side, it, it was everywhere, you know. Um, so it wasn't particular to any any specific area of the woods but this time <clears throat> you know I'm it, it was almost like a a good omen uh, is why I'm bringing it up because if you heard that whistle and the reason I replied and I learned to reply uh, as like a thank you um, you'd follow in that direction and you'd, you'd usually find a uh, saying now what what I didn't feel comfortable with is and it was only out there in that in deep woods uh, uh, this is where I learned how to how to actually patch up saying like it should be uh, whoever was out here in these woods you know however long prior it could have even been uh, natives you know but the way they did these saying patches in these deep old growth forest uh, <clears throat> was you'd find a you would find a white oak or a red oak uh, on a north slope on that north side of that oak you would you would bunch up your berries you'd, you'd kind of level it off if it needed it but the, the thing about the way oaks grew is if uh, if it was a slope right there on the top side of the slope they generally made a pocket with their roots as as they as they fingered out off the bottom so you would use that pocket and that's where you'd put your saying berries you know even if you found them you know up the hill down the hill you'd bring them to to a couple of these oaks you'd find you know you'd pick them out and you'd know the ones uh it wasn't just any tree you'd want to do this to you'd find a couple trees uh per 10 20 yards that would fit this description I'm talking about. <clears throat> so you you keep your berries and because the way it works, man, and they the same way as trees. <clears throat> You'd find the big saying up top, uh, but anyway, them berries slowly over the course of hundreds and thousands of years uh, fall down that hill. And you'll have ginseng growing all up and down that hill where those berries slowly fell and grew back and fell and grew back. Some of them didn't germinate or some of them didn't take. Or some of them got ate and flown away or walked away and came out somewhere else. And, you know, I mean, so it, it wasn't just like a, a straight line of saying. It was, <clears throat> it was broken and all scattered. But generally speaking, you could follow some some saying up to the top and that's where you'd find some big ones you know your three prongs your four prongs your five prongs um, uh, double tier triple tier berries uh, th those are signs of really really old saying uh, 
Uh, whereas like down in your valley and, and generally on your ridge, you're going to have your nice and healthy looking saying. They stand out. You can see them a pretty good distance off, especially, you know, when it's saying season. Uh, them berries glow uh, a brilliant red, a ruby red, and the leaves turn like a, a tobacco yellow, a tobacco gold, you know, so <clears throat> and they'll, they'll glow in the woods, especially since they, they prefer the northern slope, which is already naturally dark and holds the moisture longer because of the lack of the sunlight. So, so everything's naturally darker on that side, and here you got this this burst of, of red and gold. Just, mm. it's very satisfying to hunt. Um, but anyway, uh, you, you'd make these patches, and I knew uh, just by how I studied up on this, looking at them, you know, that I I was like, this this is not natural. But whoever did this, they did it hundreds of years ago, um, if not longer. So I had this, I had my own, uh, you know, I, I didn't go crazy and dig up everything. I, I just take this route, that route, this route, that route. And I knew the two prong rule and the three prong rule. And you just, you know, you look, it, there's people that think that you can make money off that plant and uh, they'll just, they'll rip it up and, and they won't care about nothing and that's why that plant's so rare you know there's no respect they just all they see is green you know and that that plant's a spiritual plant that plant is a very special plant and there's that plant is is revered by multiple cultures who, who lived in a region that was lucky enough where it could grow, you know, and when they found it, they knew that they had found something like, this is different, you know, and if you can imagine Kentucky wild ginseng, if, if, if horses, their bones and their tendons are made stronger from that lime and, and that moisture and that ground, uh, you know, just imagine the, the extra special qualities that Kentucky wild ginseng had to it that he, other other places ginseng grew, grew didn't have those magical qualities that that Kentucky steel that you get from that that Kentucky earth was embedded in that Kentucky saying you know what I mean so um, it, it, there is a respect I, I was I was taught right I think and I respected the plant and I, I did not abuse it um, so these patches were neat and I took to taking I, I took to the custom that I had found them in and uh, that's what I did elsewhere and I made my own patches you know uh, I was using that ancient whoever did that I, I used their ancient knowledge to make my own patches um, but that that whistle uh, generally would draw me towards a lucky patch of saying you know but um so usually I'm out singing. I'd have a, uh, I'd have my dog Abel. Um, sometimes I'd have another dog, Ninja. Uh, but this was back when it was just Abel. And uh, you know, Walmart bag and a butter knife. Um, I'd started carrying a little, little spade trowel, because um, this time of the year is the best time of the year to be digging up you know if i come across what i know is an orchid i've been waiting for it to die back you know go go dormant so i can dig it up and bring it home so i would also carry a like a six inch uh digging trowel if it perfect in the back pocket it never really bothered me too much you know so we're up in uh we're up in the undiscovered country pretty good ways and I'd heard that whistle and I, I'd followed it and uh, you know sometimes you follow that whistle you get you get turned around man and uh, before you know it you'll be way up in them woods um, so you, you kind of had to keep a awareness of where the sun the sunlight was dropping in from you know what I mean so you can get out you want to go opposite of that that sun 
when it starts getting dark, which it starts getting dark way before sunset in them woods. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, so it led me, it led me pretty far in there, and, and all of a sudden you heard that alpha, uh, the alpha to the pack of the west. He fired up. He was about a ridge or two over, and you heard the whole pack fire up, man, and you you knew they they were on a they were on a hunt. Uh, it didn't take them long, but matter of fact, you probably wouldn't even have heard it uh, from the house. I was just so close, I heard it, you know. But it, it got my, it sparked my curiosity. I was, I was quite a curious kid, uh, so you know, I heard all this commotion. I was naturally drawn to it. So I, I went over the ridge. I came up the next valley. I went up top that ridge too. You could hear them over there. They, they were still doing some slight chirps and barks. You know, you could tell they were they were fighting something, but it wasn't nothing major. They they did this or whatever they were after. I got up top that ridge. And, uh, <clears throat> that ridge, it came up in there like a a, a punch bowl. Uh, it came up in there like a tube sock. The uh, we were up in the, the toe of it, you know what I mean? And it just ran out from there. And what them coyotes did is they they, they ran them deer up into the, the end of it. And they were making their, they were, they were having their way with them down there. And uh, I got up on top of that ridge and Abel looked at me. I said, no. And he looked at me and he started shaking his back leg. I said, no. And I reached for him. And before I could grab him, he took off. And uh, so, you know, I'm like, I say a couple choice words. I'm yelling, I'm whistling. I'm like, I'm yelling, man. And he's not stopping. He's going. He's running so fast that when this dog would run this fast, it looked like his, his rear end was trying to outrun his front end. That's how fast that dog was charging in on 15, 20 coyotes. And one of them was a really that the Western Pack Alpha Coyote, in my opinion, was like uh, it, it wasn't a coyote; it was a wolf. It was a it was just different. Okay, um, the Western Pack Alpha looked like a coyote. It was bigger than a coyote, but instead of uh, the, the 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 white to gold and all that this 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 coyote was a uh, like a dark gray to uh, a red mahogany and up on top like where its hackles would be and it wrapped around to like it it's uh like a husky would have where that white pattern is um, it, it did the same thing except this was really thick black as night fur uh, sitting up on top that uh, that red mahogany uh, back you know it was a very uh, it, that dog did not look like the rest of that pack now you could tell it was breeding with that pack you could see it its genetics had been passed on to those other dogs but that alpha dog in that western pack was just <laughs> he was maybe 150 pounds dog you know he was a big dog and what what had happened was um, they had they had gotten several does and uh, they they were newborn so they had gotten several does and several fawns and I guess they had trapped um, they had they had crippled several of them and they weren't even like finishing them off you know they were just crippling them on and going and getting more so there was this weird kind of coyote deer massacre going on in this little punch bowl uh, they had they had a good half dozen uh, deer and another good half dozen or even a dozen uh, babies down in there and they were all just scrambling everywhere and Abel's charging into the middle of this mess uh, teeth and barks you know and blood and I didn't know what else to do 
you know, I mean, look, I, of course, I grabbed the biggest stick I could find, but I'm charging in behind them, you know. And, um, I swapped out my butter knife for that, uh, uh, trowel. And, uh, I'm yelling as much as I could. I'm like, ah, and, you know, at first, when they heard us come over the ridge, you could tell they were affected. They were a little bit squirmish, um, but that, that that alpha didn't seem affected at all and I think it's because all it saw was Abel and uh so Abel hit that alpha and when Abel hit that alpha um every other coyote all of a sudden just they were not as squirmish it like caught their attention um uh, all of them seemed to stop exactly where they were um couple of them took a couple more steps but you know all of them it, you could tell it got it got a dozen plus coyotes to stop moving instantly and the rest trickled off and stopped and turned uh, this is something I noticed from my point of view being about uh, I don't know 30 feet behind my dog maybe 50 feet because he was pretty fast I'm fast but I ain't that fast and I had to get the stick and all that <clears throat> so and then I come down, I stop maybe, you know, 20 feet from them. And they're going at it. And I'm yelling and I'm yelling. And I'm getting bigger and bigger and I'm just yelling. And I'm waving and I'm all that. I stop, I pick up a rock and I chuck it at them and it hits the dog. And I yell at Abel and I throw another rock and it hits the dog. And the dog, you know, it kind of ran a step back and Abel, like comes towards me you know and I hit I, I pick up another rock and I throw it at the dog and I hit it again and it didn't move this time you know it, it did you know it did like this head shake and then it did and then it did you know what an alpha dog does when it's challenged and uh it did this it did this weird uh at first it did this weird it did this weird howl where where I know I could hear it, but it was really, really high pitch. Like, it wasn't a normal howl. It was almost like a dog whistle. And all the other coyotes in them woods reacted to it. And then he started doing, like, a growling, <clears throat> tooth chatter alpha challenge to me. Me and Abel. And uh, Abel started cowering and whimpering right behind me. And, um, you know, I didn't have no choice. I knew... I done been around cows so long, I knew when <clears throat> when an animal is challenging who you are, um, you as a response as an animal, animal to animal, you stand your ground. I've had it to where uh, the whole earth seemed to be moving towards me because, you know, 3,800 head of cattle generally you would run into uh anywhere between you know 20 to 90 cows in a pack they they ran in their own little pecking order you know but 90 90 cows is is about the the top of the 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 groups that would run around uh and you'd have at least 20 or 30 on the bottom end you know so you never really ran into a small herd of cattle and I've had some of those 90 packs coming straight at me. And uh, I knew, you know, if you run, they will chase. But if you stand, they'll get about uh, 10 feet, uh, sometimes even closer. Uh, they'll start slowing down, you know, but they'll, they'll walk up to you if you just stand there. Um, and then they'll sniff. And then you can do your thing. You know what I mean? But if you go to run, they're just going to keep running. So, I had grown accustomed to standing my ground. When I'm, when I'm challenged by any animal, um, on an animal-to-animal -animal level, that's what I did. So, he's doing his display, and I'm doing my display. And, you know, I, I probably look like a, look like a fool. I was hooting and hollering and yelling and I even started growling and, and doing doing this uh this uh Indian call Cherokee taught me man and I'm 
I'm doing everything I had in my power to sound the biggest I ever did, and it didn't matter to that dog. He kept getting closer and closer and closer, and he huckled down his head. And when he came at me, I swung that, I had about a five foot, uh, I had basically a five foot long three by three. And uh, now it, it was only, it was, you know, it was a stick that I had found on the ground, so it wasn't necessarily the strongest thing possible. But when he came at me, I swung that thing. Uh, I swung that thing as hard as I could, and I came straight across that dog's face. And uh, it 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 knocked the wind out of you know. Uh, I don't think he was expecting that at all. Uh, now, following up that, I you know, I'm not. I can't get too gruesome, but let's just say I, I dug that trowel in right in you know and that alpha he he uh I, I knocked the wind right out of him I took all the confidence he had um, it tucked tail you know and uh you could tell it had been defeated cause it, it kinda whimpered tucked tail uh walked away um and it no longer had taken like its third or fourth step of defeat. And there goes Abel darting right past me. Um, and he hit that dog with with the force of a, of a charging rhino, dude. He knocked that dog through the air with a, he was, he was locked on um, where they lock on. I'm not sure if I can say it in the story or not. But if you know where a dog goes for, that's where he was. And he hit it full force charge, dude. Um, and, and he knocked that dog down. And he did not let go. Um, that that alpha, he tried to call. He There was nothing there for him to call through. You know what I mean? It, it had been crushed. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so... Abel uh, made sure that alpha was done. And, uh, I got him off of him, you know, and we're, we're kind of in this, you know, when Abel hit, hold on, when Abel hit that alpha, uh, the, every other coyote that was standing, they took off, everything, there was nothing else to see, they all ran off, all of them, as they should have to start, you know, like, uh, there was something wrong with that alpha, <clears throat> and, uh, there was something different with that alpha and you know initially um, my thing was is I want to take this dog back other people got to see this dog this dog is this dog is different this dog you could tell this this dog was not like any other coyote and uh, it did weigh a good it was 150 easy 150 pound dog um, I was gonna figure up a way of uh, uh, fixing up a way to drag it you know and just about that time when I stopped to th start thinking it had gotten quiet enough to where uh, I heard something scurrying around and up to the ridge going back east you know trying to crawl out of the valley was this little uh, fawn you know it was the only movement and did these coyotes had just slaughtered this these coyotes had just inviscerated uh, this entire herd of deer and I mean they were scattered uh, does and fawns all through so that little that little fella going up the hill you know he kind of caught my attention as like a very all moment you know and I, I ran up to him and what they had done is they clipped him well, that's what I was saying they were going around and like they were they were wounding these animals and and not really finishing them so I guess they were trying to wound as many as they could and then eventually they would be able to finish them off and bring them all back or whatever you know however they did that but they had it, they had uh, nipped at the back of this uh, this fawn's rear legs and you know they'd nipped it up good enough to where it couldn't uh, really walk so 
and you know I approached it you could tell it was it was calling but there, um, there was no there was no mom there for it you know and that kind of got to me so I figured I'd come back for the coyote and I gotta get this little guy out of here um, uh, and when I first picked him up you know I took my shirt off tied it around my waist I picked him up I put him over my shoulders you know he was about 70 pounds he wasn't that bad 70 pounds uh, and he started nipping at the back of my head you know I kind of tucked kind of tucked my head a little bit and rolled my ear down towards my shoulder and pulled my shoulder up so he couldn't reach my ear you know he nipped at my hair a little bit uh, and then he, he eventually calmed down but he kept making that wounded deer call and uh, I had about a I'd say about a four hour uh, hike to get out of there I was a good I was almost five miles in easy and uh, so by the time I got back you know first off you know walking back with a, a wounded animal call and a, a predator uh, infested set of the woods that sucked so on top of that you know I, I had multiple times where I know I was being followed you know I know I was being followed um, I just didn't have time for it um, that deer was bleeding out and I had to get back home with it you know? um, so I'd gotten about an hour and a half in and it, it really did start calming down um, it still did its call but instead of like every two or three seconds it was down to maybe once every minute he still had a good solid pulse I could feel that <clears throat> um, but anyway I got home and uh, we had dog cages uh, and I had put the deer inside one of the dog cages and it was right it was just before sunset you know the sun had uh, touched the horizon but it hadn't fallen so it, it had lit up all pretty colors outside everybody was inside eating you know so I was kind of late and they you know they knew it uh, but I opened the door and here I'm standing just covered in, covered in this deer's blood but they didn't know that all they know is here I am I'm late for dinner I open the door and I'm standing there without a shirt on coated in blood you know so they all looked at me with big eyes and I was like oh it's not my blood you know and they that made them all like take a gasp like oh no what the you know and it's like no 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 I was like come with me <laughs> you know and it was like I saved this deer look I saved this deer and I, I tried explaining everything to them and they're just like oh mom was going on and I got in so much trouble you know because I shouldn't have been out there and doing the things I was doing and you know coyotes and how dare you chase them and what are you talking about and all these you know but they wound up calling the, the field and wildlife and they came out there and you know I told them what I encountered and they 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 penciled it in their little book and they they picked that deer up you know they said they might be able to save its life you know or they, they took that deer and uh my little oddity that goes with this is uh, my mom wound up getting me this little uh, baby deer beanie baby little Thai beanie baby as like a my little hero token to go with saving that deer's life because uh, it wasn't so much an act of bravery so much as it was an act of stupidity and uh, luckily I just knew how to handle myself whenever I was uh, in such a situation uh, and you know it, I came out on the right side of that but <clears throat> I was in trouble for days uh, I couldn't go back to the woods you know mom mom had a concern for my safety and any parent should uh, as a parent now I completely understand and, and respect that and I'm surprised I was able to do what I was able to do uh, but you know I mean it was a different time back then um, but it took several days 
and I kept telling dad about this animal I'd fought you know like dude you gotta see it I got the proof it's there you know I gotta go get it you know and so it was maybe three days before I was able to go back <clears throat> and that was the first place I went straight back um, I come up over that ridge you know and that that entire valley had been picked clean there wasn't a body nowhere you could see where uh, some of the animals had been eviscerated you know tufts of fur everywhere they had been cleaned up a little bit but the, the, everything was missing there wasn't a carcass in that in that entire little valley he, I followed the valley down because for a while you could you could see where everything was dragged you know but it seemed to, it seemed to be like I don't know they they just disappeared uh, they were dragged maybe uh, eighth mile quarter mile you know around that first little turn because uh, I described this valley as a sock right so they were up in the toe of the sock the punch bowl so it actually would go down straight to the heel and then turn around and go down like the neck uh, of the sock you know what I mean um, so right around past that heel where it turned those tracks and everything disappeared like there was never anything there um, that was one thing that was strange I mean I could I, I have tracked a spider in a sandstorm you know I, I'm really good at, at tracking uh, Cherokee taught me how to track and uh, I'm really good at tracking I even uh, when we moved out of there um, my tracking uh, reputation followed because uh, one of my one of my dad's friend's son shot this deer up on this ridge and, uh, and I, I digress man. But I could track real good is what I'm saying. Um, so when I say it looked like these things just disappeared, it was like they just disappeared. There was no there was no evidence of them them going in any other direction or being eaten or nothing. They, it's like they flew straight up. So that was weird. And then of course there was no body for me to bring back um, to tell. It was, uh, it was, it wasn't that, you could tell that that western pack was still broke up uh, the following, you know, lunar cycle. When, when they, you'd normally all, you'd, you'd go out and you'd hear them everywhere. Um, uh, there was at least two lunar cycles where it was like there was no coyotes at all anywhere. Everything had been messed up. Um, and then uh, it was about that third or fourth lunar cycle you heard them all again and you could tell uh, this if, if you had heard my my description of these packs during uh, my one last time episodes um, that would be this description of these packs because the the new alpha dog that had taken out taken over out west uh, uh, it, it was one of those different dogs too it was big you just tell it was big like maybe it was one of the the, the descendants of that one that had grown up you know I don't know but you could tell it was bigger and um, the other thing I want to I like to point out here is because um, a lot of people when you bring up coyotes they all go on like come on man you didn't fight no coyotes and it's like well for the most part coyotes should be skittish and they are a lot of places they are and they should be everywhere um, but this part of the woods they weren't nobody hunted these parts of the woods nobody hunted uh, there was hunters I, there was I knew hunters that lived around there but uh, they go somewhere else to hunt and nobody came in to hunt um, out of all the years we lived there there was uh, the only person I ever seen go in there was was the owner um, and it's not like he wouldn't give somebody else permission to go hunting you know it's just nobody ever asked uh, and nobody ever went so these these coyotes they were never hunted um, they were pretty much raised feral 
and for the most part they were skittish and they were you know if me and me and my dogs were around if you saw them they were like they were good they would come close they would I guess check us out but they would run on you know but they wouldn't run off like they were spooked they'd just have that uh open mouth um I'm moving by type uh, run to them you know and you'd see them they generally would stay ridge top when I'm, I'm valley hopping you know and um, but they'd go by but after uh, me and Abel did that to that alpha dog um, and like I said it took a couple three months but once they recovered um, those coyotes became rather hostile towards uh, me and my dog um, and there was a, I guess, a reason for that, you know. Um, but I just, I just felt it necessary to, to kind of explain that. Um, like these coyotes were different than your average coyote. They probably had <clears throat> uh, at least 200, 100 to 200 years of nobody hunting them if not longer if they had ever been hunted at all it had been at least that long since they've been shot at so uh, they had no reason to fear uh, humans like they do elsewhere uh, and then on top of that they had an extra particular reason to uh, be mad at, at me and my dog for what, what we had done you know but yeah.